Hello, I am Joshua P. Warren, and this is Joshua P. Warren Daily. And it's about damn time I gave you an update, huh? It's been a while. I told you I was going to be out in the desert filming and that I frequently would not have a cell phone signal or any way of making contact. And Well, now I am back uh, with more reliable signals and contact for a while. And so it's time for me to let you know about at least one of my recent adventures. I'm also going to tell you in this podcast a little bit more about the project that I'm working on because it's pretty sweeping and time consuming and it is going to make my schedule much more erratic than usual for oh a long time maybe even over the next year so I'll explain more about that but I told you that at least one of the places I was going to is a place that is renowned for danger well now I can tell you where I went as one of my filming locations Death Valley the name says it all right Death Valley California and that is not so far away from where I live here in Las Vegas I can drive there in a little over two hours Death Valley is famous for a lot of a lot of reasons but the main reason is because it is the hottest place on earth on July 10th of 1913 the hottest temperature ever measured on earth was there at a, a spot called Badwater Basin and that was 134 degrees Fahrenheit for those of you who are on the metric system there that's 56.6 degrees Celsius hottest temperature ever measured on earth and that's measuring it from a stand that's you know a few feet off the ground in fact on that day there was a ranch caretaker that happened to be there at Badwater Basin uh, his name was Oscar Denton and he said that day this is a quote it was so hot that swallows and by the way if you're not familiar with what he's talking about that's a type of bird okay it was so hot that swallows in full flight fell to the earth dead when I went out to read the thermometer with a wet Turkish towel on my head it was dry before I returned end quote 134 degrees Fahrenheit and also that day nearby there was a guy named Fred Corkill and he was running a lab at a borax mine and he officially measured the temperature in his lab at 173 degrees Fahrenheit that's 78 degrees Celsius now again we're talking about air temperature but the ground temperature there can get over 200 degrees Fahrenheit which is 93.3 Celsius in fact the Rangers at Death Valley because it's a national park it's a very very big national park the Rangers there have told people please stop frying eggs on the sidewalks because we're having to clean up this mess all the damn time uh, because you can cook an egg at 158 degrees Fahrenheit that's 70 degrees Celsius okay so they're tired of cleaning fried eggs off the sidewalk so now the, the, the Rangers tell people if you're gonna do that experiment please just do it on the hood of your car and if you want some toast just take out some fresh bread and hold it in the air for one minute and you'll have your toast um, 1913 is when they measured that temperature uh, now isn't that interesting that's over 100 years ago and that's also the year they measured the lowest temperature which was 15 degrees Fahrenheit 
and that's negative 10 degrees Celsius. So we have a lot of talk about all this extreme climate change that's happening in the world and it's very strange to think that over 100 years ago the hottest temperature at Death Valley and the lowest temperature were measured. Hmm. Makes you maybe put some things in other perspectives when we when we talk about global warming and climate change. I don't know. I don't just food for thought on that one. One of the reasons that Badwater Basin there at uh, at Death Valley is so hot is because it is the lowest point in the Western Hemisphere. Uh, it's 282 feet below sea level. That's 85.9 meters. So it is the hottest and also driest place on earth the humidity there is usually just two percent or less in fact back in the old days before air conditioning miners who worked in the area they found there are some if you're lucky you can find some little creeks in uh, in, in the area miners would sleep in a creek and prop up their heads to keep from drowning that's how hot and uncomfortable it was uh, Death Valley is called Death Valley primarily because, okay, in 1846, this terrible incident happened in American history. It is the story of the Donner Party. So there was this group of pioneers that were traveling over the Sierra Nevada mountains, heading over toward California there, and they got... Uh, they got trapped in a blizzard in the middle of winter and it was uh, the most terrible conditions you can imagine and basically the only way they ended up surviving is they started eating each other and that you know if you don't know about the story of the Donner party you can look that up and and get all the details for yourself but this horrified the American public uh, and and so and again that was 1846 when the Donner Party start, you know ran into trouble and so this became big big national news everybody knew about this in America. So just a few years later, in 1849, when gold was discovered in California, creating the gold rush, you had thousands of pioneers who were heading to California trying to seek their fortune and get gold. We call them the 49ers, just like the football team, right? And so the 49ers, they they were all aware of what had happened to the Donner Party. And so they did not want to make the same mistake and try to cut across these big, steep, harrowing mountains in, in the wintertime. And they started talking to different sort of guides and trackers and, 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 and trappers and stuff who said, well, look, if you instead of going straight across like the Donner Party did, if you go south, if you go all the way south and then you, you kind of go to the very end of the Sierra Nevadas, if for one thing, it's going to be uh, so warm, you're, you're, it's unlikely you're going to run into any snow. And there is a pass there called Walker Pass that you can go through. And if you make it to Walker Pass, then you go right on over to uh, California. Sounded like a much better deal, right? So people said, okay, great. We're going to go way south. We'll go through this desert. We'll find Walker Pass. And that way, we don't end up like the Donner Party somehow. So the problem is... The southern route wasn't that much better than the northern route, especially in the summertime. It had its own set of extreme challenges. So, for example, when people made it down to what we now call Death Valley, they, of course, there's very little water there, and it's hard to find it. When you get to Death Valley, it just looks like big, barren sand dunes and rocky cliffs and it's just it's just a very naked barren rugged land you can imagine and it's kind of a miracle that they even made it that far 
because all the land around here in Nevada is is harsh, you know, and and that part of California, it's all harsh. Like here in Nevada, you know, any anytime there's a town like an old town, it's always some kind of springs, you know, it's like a Tule Springs or Bonnie Springs or Alamo Springs or everything is a spring because that was the only way you could, you know, you could survive was to know where these springs were. And so anyway, what would happen is the pioneers who made it down there to what we now call Badwater Basin, at first they were just delighted because they would see these sort of murky looking pools of water and then they would rush down there for a drink and at that point were just oh crestfallen to realize that the water on these pools is has twice the salt of seawater it's undrinkable that's why they call it bad water bad water basin and so i mean it was just like uh what do we do now uh, you know that in fact Badwater Basin is just like a giant salt flat it's like 95 percent table salt you can pick up a little of it and I did that and put it in your mouth and it's just like strong table salt so anyway that was their first big oh shit you know when they got there and they realized that the water was was too salty but if they made it farther than that now they run into this area which we now call the devil's golf course and the devil's golf course is this big giant expanse i don't know how many miles it goes of just these huge big rugged it's just like a it's like a a whole sheet of rugged salt and mineral crystal formations that are just so sharp and jagged uh, I, I mean, imagine like the surface of some super, you know, rocky planet with all these erosions. It was almost impossible to take a wagon across it without breaking the wheels. Horses could barely walk across it. I mean, though, and then those people who somehow, you know, maybe they got lucky and there was, there was some rain because occasionally it does rain there. Um, those people who were lucky enough to make it all that far, maybe they were delirious or, or whatever, but they would, for some reason, have just like a tendency to walk right past Walker Pass and just never even see it. It just sort of blended into the landscape. And so I think of the very first party that we know of historically that went there, like 13 people perished. And then after that, the deaths just kept kept uh, kept mounting, and there was one party that just miraculously survived for about uh, two months, and I think it, only one of their party died, and they got they had an angel with them because some cowboys found them somehow and more or less rescued them. And so the story is that one of these haggard old guys who had been surviving out there right before he went through the pass <clears throat> excuse me he um he turned and he looked back one last time and said goodbye death valley and that was reported and that name stuck so over the years uh who knows how many people actually died because they underestimated what it was like to be in such a harsh in a hot dry climate where there's no shelter you don't have any trees there you can't like cut open a cactus and drink from it or any of that kind of bullshit and one thing that, that is weird though is that even though the water like at Badwater Basin is so hot and salty uh, apparently there are some uh, forms of life in it there's some snails that can live in there I think these little fish they call pup fish um, so you know life always finds a way right but anyway that is why it's called death valley primarily speaking so knowing that this place is death valley knowing that the hottest time of year to go there is mid-july well guess what i got the bright idea hey let's go film there in mid-july 
if we're going to do it, let's fucking do it right. You know, like, let's go in there and really have an extreme experience and see what this is all about. That was my thought on the matter. So, I look, I may not always be the guy you want to hang out with. So, without giving you uh, the larger context yet of, of sort of what I'm doing, here is what happened. I rented a brand new blue convertible Mustang. I deputized Lauren as my chauffeur. And we got in this Mustang with all the equipment and we headed to Death Valley mid-July hoping for it just to be a, a super hot miserable experience and just driving there you know with the top down uh it's, it's funny because it, I, I, you know i got a convertible so i could get all these great shots with the camera and everything but as we were driving there with the top down and the air conditioning blasting and we're both wearing big hats it was still hot I still felt like I was getting sunburned, you know, and it just got hotter and hotter and hotter, of course, as we got closer and closer. And as we got close, to, like once once we entered California, we crossed the border from Nevada over to, into California, and we're on like the, the home stretch heading into Death Valley. You know how in movies you see these shots of the heat mirage just sort of wavering off of the pavement? Because you have these roads that just they go to that vanishing point in the distance and I swear it just looks like the road is a pond you know it, it looks just like water in front of you because it's reflecting the sky and distorting everything and I shot some cool footage of like just that mirage effect of, of the water shimmering as, we, as it got hotter and hotter and let me tell you, if you're going to go to Death Valley and you are thinking that, oh, this is just going to be some kind of tourist trap or whatever, you are very, very mistaken. This is a no bullshit place to travel to. I mean, I went to the National Park Service site the day we left and it had an extreme heat warning on it and it said if you're going to come here be prepared to survive i have a screenshot of that the last place to get gas was in nevada in pahrump and we had to drive you know over an hour after that to get into death valley so if you're going to do the, the route that i did to get to death valley the, the scenic route you better take advantage of that one last gas station there in Pahrump and they tell you there's a signs like this is your last chance they are not kidding so this is not a this is not a bullshit trip like that's why I rented a brand new car instead of driving my own car you know there's no cell phone signal out there there's just not and um, I had a CB with me I don't know if that actually would do much good in an emergency but it's better than nothing um, plenty of water I mean you got to be prepared if you get a flat tire how you're gonna deal with that but it, don't take it lightly if you're gonna go out there you could end up in a, in a very bad situation because you drive for miles and miles and miles and you don't see anything you don't see anything I mean even when you enter Death Valley National Park which is again a giant park even because just a small part of it is the actual valley um, you have to pay $30 to get in and there's not even a person there uh, what you do is you they have like an ATM under a shed and you get out and put your ATM uh, card your, your debit card in the ATM or whatever and they get they spit out a ticket that you put on your windshield and at least they give you a map as well because you're not going to be able to get on your phone and, and you know get any information no GPS the whole time I was there filming, I never actually saw a ranger once. And that was pretty shocking to me in the middle of July. But it's a big place, and everybody's understaffed right now. 
that's the thing you have to understand about traveling there right now. Um, the whole place is barren. There's nothing there to do. And of the stuff that is there, like, for example, I, I stayed at a place called Death Valley Ranch, uh, which I'll tell you a little bit more about in a minute. I mean, there was there's like a visitor center and some other stuff that's usually open, but none of that stuff is open because of the COVID-19 thing. So this is after the 4th of July. So everybody's all partied out and nobody's taking trips anyway. So there are very few people because of that. There are very few people because of it being just so, you know, like the hottest time of the year. And with the COVID-19 thing, there's there's even less people. And you got to wear a mask. You have to wear a mask when you are around people, when you're, when you're in this environment. So anyway... When we got to Death Valley, we were struck by just how vast and barren and how far you would drive without any resources or even passing a car. And when we finally got to the Death Valley Ranch, most of it was uh, was was closed, but that they but they were still you know they had some they have some like little buildings on property there where they're still, as of now, uh, taking crazy people like me. And, you know, it's funny because as we uh, were driving there to the ranch, I, w I, I pulled out a bottle of Gatorade, and it's one of these bottles that had a big wide mouth, and so I was sipping Gatorade, and it was kind of bumpy, and I dribbled a couple drops of Gatorade on myself, which is sadly not uncommon. I'm not, I'm always, I have a reputation for being a messy eater, I, I, I am told. And uh, anyway, I dribbled some Gatorade on my shirt and that was totally bone dry in less than a minute. Okay, it was amazing. So anyway, I went there, checked in, they told me how to drive across their property to get to our room we had a nice room with a porch and uh it was next to a big golf course and you got to be nutso to get out there and play golf and some rocking chairs so it was a nice area i went to get some water to drink out of the faucet you would not believe how warm the water is that just comes out of the faucet there in the room in fact, it turns out that that's a problem in Death Valley for people who live there, for people like rangers and people who are workers at, at this resort, this ranch or whatever. Um, a lot of people use their water heater as just a storage container to let the water that comes from the ground cool before they drink it. Because you might wonder, for example, well, why is there any kind of water in Bad Water Basin? They say there is an underground aquifer that comes from up in the mountains that collects some of the runoff from these extremely high mountains. And that is what creates some of these little pools of water. So there is some water to be accessed if you know how to get it and you know where you are and what you're doing. But... Uh, yeah, it's really, really warm just coming out, coming out of the faucet. So anyway, we got settled into our room, had a little, uh, little lunch or whatever, and then we headed off, of course, to Badwater Basin. This is this is the the centerpiece of Death Valley. And I, of course, we had a thermometer on our car, and there was a thermometer mounted on one of the uh, properties there. And the day that I got there, it was 117 degrees. So in Death Valley terms, a relatively cool day. Because frankly, it has gotten 117 degrees in Las Vegas before. So I've experienced 117 degrees. But the 117 degrees combined with a 10 out of 10 on the UV meter and you know two percent humidity i mean that that's a that's a, a combo 
that really starts like it starts zapping you and hitting you and you realize like man I got to keep liquid in me so we drove from the ranch like down this road where there was nothing for I think it was 17 miles and finally there was a pull off and here is Badwater Basin which again is this big vast like salt flat expanse before you and what's weird is we got out of the car and of course I'm filming this whole thing we got out of the car and right next to Badwater Basin is this pretty tall rocky mountain there's like a big cliff there and when you're standing there you crane your neck back and you look at this cliff and there's a little sign up there on the side of the cliff and the sign says sea level so that uh, really helps you understand that you are 282 feet below sea level which again we're talking 85.9 meters so we get out of the car of course and we're walking around and it's just you know the heat and the dryness and the whole and it's just pressing down on you and plus Lauren was wearing flip-flops and she said you know the ground as I told you gets to be over 200 degrees she said that it felt like that her feet were just in an oven like her legs and her feet were on fire so we get out there and I say to Lauren Lauren I've decided to do something special at this extraordinary spot on earth I brought my Native American flute one of my Native American flutes and I'm going to walk out here into the middle of this basin in the middle of this extreme desert and I want you to videotape me playing this flute and Lauren goes oh Jesus Are you, you're gonna embarrass me you know in front of these people and which by the way like there was like two people there I said oh, Lauren no 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 I um it's nothing, nothing to be embarrassed about I'm gonna commune with nature you know this just seems, seems like a cool thing to do and she goes uh, uh, you remind me of this like new age boyfriend and some chick flick she'd seen I was like Lauren do you know how many ladies out there would be swooning over a man who would take him out to the middle of Death Valley and play the Native American flute for him but I don't I, I'm pretty sure I did not convince her uh, anyway look she she played along we went out onto the basin and I did play the flute I didn't play it perfectly because there was a heck of a wind blowing and it was kind of hard to actually control the notes in the flute but for me it was a meditative moment and she captured it on uh, on film and you know what I am gonna post that for you on my Twitter P, uh, Twitter page there at Joshua P Warren at Joshua P Warren you can go there and you can see me playing the flute in the middle of Badwater Basin and I think you will see there was nobody would ever be embarrassed by that that's that's my opinion but you know Lauren's a little more sensitive than I am I'm the kind of guy who can crash a party and she doesn't like doing that sort of stuff so anyway after that I mean you we didn't stay there that long for obvious reasons because you're pretty much dying when you're out there <laughs> and there are all these roads that you can go off to other places but most of them are dirt roads and you really need an SUV and people get flat tires all the time because of these jagged rocks and that wasn't a big part like for me exploring Death Valley was not my primary goal I I wanted to go there and uh, document some things for this project I'm working on and I also wanted to do a little UFO hunting and ghost hunting and we'll get to that in a minute 
So after that, we drove back to Death Valley Ranch. And they have a really cool old western saloon there. And uh, it was open, but you could not eat there because of the COVID-19 stuff. So we went there and we ordered some food and once we got it we were able to take it back to the room chow down and then on the property they have this big nice swimming pool and what's especially interesting is that it is a spring fed pool and it's 85 degrees year round. So once the sun set we went to this pool and and swam around and it, it felt great because you know how usually you get into a pool and when your your skin touches the water there's a that little moment of shock you have to get o over when it's like it's cold you know that didn't happen at all i mean you just slip right into this and there was no transitional uh shock period whatsoever it, it just felt like you were you were back in the womb again right and so we really enjoyed being in this nice 85 degree spring fed pool and it was funny because um we started seeing at that time bats that would fly down and uh they would swoop down and take a sip from the pool water and then fly away and then they'd come back a couple minutes later and take a sip and fly away so I guess they can drink that pool, swimming pool or water without any kind of a problem. Um, I don't know how much life there really is around there. I know there are ground tortoises. Uh, I guess, they call them desert tortoises, I guess. That's what they call them. And they, and they stay in the ground during the day. And then um, you've got, of course, rattlesnakes. And uh, there are on the outskirts in the mountains, there are mountain lions and coyotes and stuff like that. But we didn't see much in terms of life. But it was kind of cool to watch the bats doing that. So we we hung out in the pool for you know like an hour and a half or something. And then when we got out of the pool, I laid down on um, one of these you know lounge chairs or whatever. And within certainly within uh, two minutes, I was bone dry. Like my hair, my swim trunks, everything was bone dry. So that's pretty cool. You really don't even need a, a hair dryer if you live in Death Valley. So then we went back, took a shower, and it's like, now it's time to really go out and do something fun in the UFO arena because not only is Death Valley the hottest place and the driest place on Earth, but guess what? Here is what the National Park service site says it says death valley offers some of the best stargazing in america the international dark sky association has designated death valley national park as a gold tier dark sky park the highest rating of darkness now maybe you've heard about some of these places that are called dark sky parks and I've always wanted to go to one because I've been to some pretty impressive, you know, places where you can see the stars like you wouldn't believe. But I've, I've never actually been to like a top tier dark sky park before and neither had Lauren. And so I brought my night vision goggles. And uh, even though when we were there, the moon was um, was bright the moon was not going to rise until like close to midnight so we were able to drive down the road and find a spot where we got out and had this just breathtaking view of the sky i mean where there was no moon and i can only describe it as like just a it's like a layer of diamonds twinkling everywhere you'd look and you could see all the big streaks of the milky way like silvery clouds and i mean if you've never been to one of these places you can imagine right so then i took out the night vision goggles and it you know you can just see everything through the night vision goggles just a really really impressive place by the way it was still hot as hell at night 
big wind picked up, so it's like you're it's like you're being in a bla- you're in a blast furnace, but you look up and you see this incredible sky. And I saw some satellites and some other interesting stuff, but I don't think I saw anything that I would consider a UFO. Uh, I was a little disappointed when the moon finally did start rising because, you know, it really brightened things up tremendously. But uh, so I didn't see a UFO, but it was still a really cool time to go out and, and do some stargazing. And of course, while I was out there, guess what I did? I broke out the Native American flute and I played the flute at night as well. So I can say I've done those two things and here I was under the stars and Death Valley playing the flute very relaxing I think I connected spiritually with something there so anyway after that we went back to the room and I decided I wanted to do a ghost hunt in the room because when I had checked in I asked the lady at the front desk about ghosts in the area and she immediately was like, oh, I, I don't even want to talk about that. Like, that freaks me out. And uh, and she was just, she didn't want to address the subject, which I'm not sure if that means that, that she's seen something or she hasn't, but I got the impression that she had not seen anything like that. So when I went to the room, and this is getting, you know, pretty late at night now, uh, I'm filming a little ghost hunt because I had various pieces of equipment and I'm speaking to the spirits and I have all these historical facts at my disposal and what I will tell you is that I never got any kind of a positive result so no UFOs and no ghosts in my experience now you might say well damn that sucks I thought you were going to tell me like some kind of wild story but I want you to remember this I want you to keep this in mind and I'm not saying that this applies 100% in all cases but you know I have presented to you this theory I I have created about the relationship between paranormal activity and gravity and I have found by taking paranormal hotspots around the world and comparing them to gravitational anomalies around the world that places with a lower gravitational field tend to have more activity and places with a higher gravitational strength tend to or a stronger gravitational strength I guess I should be using the words weaker and stronger A weaker field means more paranormal activity and a stronger field means less. And I think that uh, it's interesting that you find a lot of paranormal hotspots where you have weak gravity and then you find more sacred sites where there is strong gravity like, you know, pyramids and temples and stuff like that. And it may be that the, the lack of gravitational forces allows something in our dimension to come into closer contact with things in other dimensions i don't know you know this is again this is in in its infancy this is just something that i realized and as far as i know i'm the first person to do this and a clock in your basement runs slower than a clock in your attic because the clock in your basement is closer to the earth's gravitational field it has stronger gravity and the clock in your attic runs faster because there's weaker gravity so in other words the lower you get then you could say the uh, the higher the likelihood that the gravity is going to be stronger because you're closer to the center of the earth and the farther away you get like being in an airplane uh, you know the weaker it's going to be because you're getting away from the center of the earth so it actually would make sense that when you are at one of the lowest places on earth death valley that if my theory is correct that would decrease the amount of paranormal activity because the gravity there is stronger and the veil you could say 
is a little thicker, a little tighter, a little more interwoven, a little harder to break through. I certainly don't mean by that that there's no paranormal activity in Death Valley, just that it's less likely, I would presume there, because of my gravitational theory regarding the paranormal. So that's an interesting thing to keep in mind, because I'd love, I would love to be like, guys, I was at Death Valley, and let me tell you, there was a demon in my room, and I saw the mothership fly over the desert. I mean, like, I, that would be a much better podcast. But I'm finding that, sure enough, there is a connection most times between gravitational strength and the likelihood of paranormal phenomena. And, you know, what's funny is that, again, when we were there, it was 117 degrees Fahrenheit, and uh, but just a few days later, it was 128 degrees Fahrenheit, um, which is uh, much closer to, to the record there. So we didn't see any kind of records broken that day, but I, I, I feel happy to say that I was in, uh, in Death Valley in, in mid-July in a year where there, there were some of the highest temperatures. So anyway, when we finally finished up in Death Valley, on our way back to Vegas, we stopped in Pahrump, which of course is where Art Bell lived. Art Bell, the, the creator, the original host of Coast to Coast AM, now hosted by George Norrie. And there is a park there in Pahrump, which is a small town out in the desert, a park called Calvada I Park. And a lot of his fans got together, especially people in the Facebook groups and stuff, and uh, they they arranged for a memorial plaque there to be created uh, to honor Art Bell. And they worked with Nye County, the Kingdom of Nye. They worked with the Kingdom of Nye uh, in order to get this erected, this plaque erected at this park. And uh, in fact, of course, I, I went there on a beautiful day. I'm looking up the picture. I posted pictures of this and a video of this uh, on my Twitter page, at Joshua P. Warren, at Joshua P. Warren. The plaque is very simple. And uh, it says, in loving memory of Art Bell, 1945 to 2018, donated by fans and Nye County. And uh, you'll see the pics of the the, uh, the plaque and also the little video and realize what a peaceful little park Calvetta is. It is small. It probably looks bigger in my video and in my pics than it actually is in person. But there's a bench right next to it. It's sort of like a little oasis. Uh, it, there are these trees there providing lots of shade and they're rustling in the breeze and there are uh, a couple of fountains there and like little waterfalls and so you have all that sort of water noise in the background which is very relaxing I mean I could sit there all day long I really could the water's dyed green which is kind of strange but you know I like it there are ducks swimming around there are some turtles that pop their heads up from time to time. There's a little island there uh, in the middle of everything with a, a bridge that takes you over to it. And uh, it was just, it, it really was an extremely peaceful place and also a rare type of place here in, in the desert out west. I mean, you don't see places like that very often that are just small and peaceful like that. So I, I really do think it's a fitting memorial for art. And I appreciate the people who put that together. And I understand that there are going to be um, some efforts underway to try to, to do more cleaning and upkeep because, you know, birds come by the plaque sometimes and do their business. Um, but uh, hey, that's mother nature for you. But I, I really enjoyed being there. And I hope you'll go to my Twitter page, Joshua P. Warren, Follow me on Twitter and uh, and see these images and watch the short little video there. I think it's about 95 seconds long. After that, 
Lauren and I stopped by the Pahrump Valley Winery, one of my favorite places. Uh, they grow their own grapes there, and it's, it's just a really nice big building. The service is excellent. They have a fantastic restaurant with wonderful food, and so we sat around and had a nice gla a glass of uh, some local wine and uh, some fine food, and it was just like the perfect sort of official end to that Death Valley trip. And then on our way back into Vegas, I stopped at a nursery. I like to go to nurseries sometimes and just look at all the different plants and everything. Stopped at a nursery and bought the biggest hat I own. And I, you know, so I, Lauren's always telling me, you know, some women have all their shoes. You have your hats. I, I like hats. I have, I have all kinds of crazy hats. And so you may have seen me post also on my social media a picture of me wearing a giant hat. That's the kind of hat you don't need sunblock with. It covers everything, right? So it was a great experience and I got some cool footage. And for now, the only footage that I'm going to release is the footage of me playing the flute there. Uh, again, that's on the Twitter page at Joshua P. Warren. But you might ask yourself, okay, so Josh, wh why are you, you know, what exactly are you up to? Why did you go out there and do this? Well, listen, you know that I am involved with TV, different TV productions on a regular basis. And so a production will come in and they'll pitch an idea and I'll say, okay, let's do it. And I'll sign a contract and we'll, we'll, we'll make the, a shoot happen. And then, you know, I might move on to another uh, production. In fact, I'm going to be on a, a new TV series that is going to be airing soon on the Travel Channel called Into the Unknown. That's the Travel Channel here in the, the United States anyway. Uh, hosted by Cliff Simon, who's famous for his work on the Stargate television show. So I'm constantly, you know, taking advantage of good TV offers. They have to be good. I turn down way more than I accept. But things have changed a little bit this year because, as I think you, uh, you may know, uh, I was featured in an Emmy-winning report here in Las Vegas that was... Um, produced by Guy Finelsi and Tiana Bonner from Fox 5 News. And Guy Finelsi and Tiana Bonner, Guy is the, he's the cameraman, editor, uh, Tiana is the reporter, storyteller, they're just a hell of a combo. I've been featured by them uh, on numerous reports since I've been here but they submitted this report and by God it won an Emmy and so basically at that point when you're involved with an Emmy winning project your real estate value increases a little bit and and there are ideas like hey let's make something else good and so here's what I will tell you um, I am teaming up with them and some other people and we have decided to produce something of a feature length uh, i can't tell you exactly what it's going to be you know that's taboo why would i do that give your ideas away and this the surprise away but this is going to be a feature length primarily documentary and it's going to, to delve into some things that have never been delved into and to show some things that have never been shown. And it's going to be good. I'm telling you, it's going to be good. The problem is production right now, it takes much longer than it did before the COVID-19 thing. And that's because that a lot of stuff is inaccessible that ordinarily would be accessible. And then also, you don't want to have to shoot yourself in a mask because, you know, two years from now, if somebody sees you in a mask, that's just going to distract them. Um, and so you want some of this stuff to be kind of like evergreen. 
And so you have to work around a lot of obstacles and, and, and do things uh, that you wouldn't have to do under ordinary circumstances to, to produce and shoot something of this magnitude right now. And so that said, uh, I just met with them last night and we're, we're hammering out more details on how we're going to proceed with this project. But um, my Death Valley shoot was part of it. And ultimately, I'm thinking that there's a good chance it's going to take us a year to make what we're making. Just because of doing it under this COVID-19 restriction. And, and hopefully uh, next year, we won't be dealing with this bullshit anymore. But... Uh, that's sort of like that that's all i can tell you right now about what i'm doing so you you will understand over the next year if uh i have a more erratic kind of schedule and there are more occasions where i'm like well i'm going to be out of contact you know for a while because i'm basically going to be you know shooting what would amount to <laughs> probably a couple seasons of a tv show <laughs> all cut together into this kick-ass feature but let me tell you, it's going it's, it's going to be well worth the time that I have to take away from the podcast occasionally to do that when you see the finished product. I have no doubt. And when it comes to this COVID thing and when it comes to just a lot of the negative stuff that's happening, that's been happening in the world, I hope if you've been listening to me for a while, especially my last two podcasts, I hope you've been keeping up your manifestation work to defeat the negativity and the evil globalist forces that are working to destroy the world and divide us and ultimately enslave us right now. And those are strong words, but that's what's happening. Because I have been, throughout all this, I have continued to keep up my daily work on projecting the manifestations that I want to materialize and destroying the ones that I want to vaporize. And yes, I'm seeing some progress. I don't want to get into the progress, but I hope you're doing the same thing. And if you don't know what I'm talking about, there are some people who listen to this podcast and then contact me and say, well, I heard you talking about your last podcast. How do I listen to that? Listen, folks, it's easy. Go to joshuapwarren.com, joshuapwarren.com, and you'll see on the home page there, in the top right-hand corner, there's a link to Joshua P. Warren Daily. And I think there's even, it might even be redundant. I think there might even be another place where it says podcast. You just click that and it will take you to a page where all of my podcasts are in a big row, like a big column going back for years. And you can go in there and you can listen to anyone you want or all of them that you want. So in my past two or three podcasts, I've been talking about us all working together as Jedis to fight this darkness and try to, you know, dematerialize a lot of the negativity that's trying to divide and conquer us right now and destroy the goodness in our world. And so if you if you, if you want to listen to that, if you missed it, go to joshuapwarren.com, click the link to Joshua P. Warren Daily and listen. Okay, they're all in order. Um, also, I've had uh, several people contact me and say, I want to read your book, Use the Force, A Jedi's Guide to the Law of Attraction, but I can't find a new copy anywhere. I go to Amazon, I can download the Kindle, but if I get a physical copy, it costs a fortune, and I, what's the deal? Well, that is true. I contacted my agent, and I said, how come people are having trouble getting new copies of my book use the force and she said that once this whole COVID-19 thing kicked in and all these shipping companies started changing their rules and regulations and their expenses and all that that the big publishing companies have stopped printing 
new copies of many of their books because it everything is off kilter it, it the, the process is slower products are getting returned if they ship them to certain countries it's costing more and so a lot of, and, and that book is now published by simon and schuster okay that's one of the biggest publishing companies in the world and so it is more and more difficult uh to get a copy a physical copy of use the force a jedi's guide to the law of attraction and and you can find some that are out there that are you know used uh, but if, if you know it, I, I realize it's complicated so if you're not happy with just listening to the audio book or reading the kindle and i understand if you're not because there's no substitute for having the physical book in your hands I want to remind you, if you go to joshuapwarren.com, go to joshuapwarren.com, and you click the link to the Curiosity Shop, then you will find that currently I do have some copies of that that are autographed, and they are part of a three-book collector set, rare books that are all signed by me. And yes, I realize it costs a little more to buy three rare signed books than to just find the book somewhere out there but at least don't forget you have that option right now i still have some of those three book sets left and if you go to joshuapwarren.com and click the link to the curiosity shop scroll down you'll see a video there where i talk about this three book set and why it's rare and special so i hope you'll do that and um you know, I just want you to know that I'm I'm going to do my best to to keep you updated on all of these wild things that are happening. I'm already really behind. I've got some great emails from from listeners to read, some wonderful reports to share with you, a lot of interesting research going on. Some of it, you know, I, I'm sorry I have to keep some of it kind of private for a while and and then release it when the time is right. Uh, some of it, I mean, I have stuff that I'm going to be telling you about soon that I think is going to blow your mind. Uh, there's, there is a lot happening this year and it's going to be good. I, I got a really nice email from a lady who listens to the show and I don't have it in front of me right now. Uh, if she's cool with it, I'll read it on a future podcast. And she says, you know what? She says the stuff, the stuff that you're doing is 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 just wonderful to listen to she's you know just getting your 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 voice and you know like your your confidence and just hearing you sort of tell it like it is the way you see it is a wonderful thing and the reason i can do that is because i uh, i'm independent okay i'm totally independent i am not beholden to anybody uh, nobody can fire me i've worked very hard to maintain independence my entire life and that is why I also hope if you go to joshuapwarren.com, you'll be sure to sign up for my free e-newsletter there. It takes you two seconds. When you do that, that allows me to be able to email you directly. Nobody else will ever contact you. I pay a lot of money for that service so that there are no ads, there's no spam. If you get an email from that, it's an email that I have sat down and written with my own fingers and hit the button and sent to you typos and all and if you write back to me i can reply to you and and i read everything that comes in but i i don't always have the time to reply i'm sure you understand that um but i hope that you will make sure we have that direct um option to communicate through the e-newsletter that you can sign up for at joshuapwarren.com and if you're a new subscriber, when you go there, you'll receive an instant digital good luck charm. And as you know, I occasionally also give out free money to subscribers randomly. And soon we're going to be doing some experiments together in gambling, which could earn some money for some of you as well. Sharing the wealth. So that is all at joshuapwarren.com. So that said, if you want to see me playing the flute and all that kind of business, go to my Twitter page, at Joshua P. Warren. And <clears throat> if you like this podcast, tell everybody about it. Forward it to everybody. Keep it going. 
that's what you know that's how we have to to get the word out and that's what encourages me to get here and you know and talk about these things i'm not just talking to myself i'm talking to those of you who enjoy this content that's important so again go to joshuapwarren.com hit up the curiosity shop sign up for the newsletter and click the link to this podcast it's called joshua p warren daily always short always free commercial free uncensored independent while you're there you can subscribe through various means or just follow me on twitter at joshua p warren at joshua p warren and i will usually tweet when a new one is available so that's it for this update i'll be giving you another one soon i promise thank you for listening thank you for your interest and support thank you for staying curious and i will talk to you again soon